tackle sleep apnea is to you know, measure thyroid hormones and start them on some therapy. And you may see some uh, marginal or considerable success over some months. So it's certainly worth pursuing. Um, edema of the face, uh, coarseness of hair, pallor of skin, uh, memory impairment, that's certainly a very common presentation. A lot of our psychiatric patients with uh, depressive symptoms, etc., uh, often have low thyroid. Constipation. Uh, about a month or so ago, for some reason, I had about four Chilean uh, clients all you know, referred one another to the clinic, and they all had severe constipation. And ironically, uh, the thyroid seemed to be the dominant issue after we did the comprehensive digestive stool analysis and sorted out the liver toxicity and all the other issues, uh, it really was the thyroid. And I don't know why I saw a spate of this amongst the Chileans, but that was interesting. Uh, gain in weight, uh, loss of hair, I think we all know about that. Uh, pallor of lips, shortness of breath, again due to the edema issues and heart issues. Uh, peripheral edema, uh, hoarseness or, or lack of voice production, aphonia, uh, certainly even anorexia, uh, variable nervousness, irritability, Menorrhagia, of course, because of the estrogen dominance situation. Uh, palpitations, of course. Deafness. How many of us think of deafness as a possible symptom for hypothyroidism? And precordial pain. So here we have a typical uh, patient with hypothyroidism with the uh, edema of the face, uh, the you know, edema of the eyelids, uh, not so much uh, thinning of the lateral eyebrows, but uh, generalized edema of the, the body as well, and possibly some of the hair loss. And of course, this is a more extreme ex example of exophthalmia, uh, proptosis, and, and, and periorbital orbital edema. So what do we know about the epidemiology of hypothyroidism? Uh, back in the 20s, Dr. Starr documented a prevalence of about 10% in her cohort population. And then in the 40s, uh, Broda Barnes uh, documented that perhaps 20% of her clients that were coming through the doors had this entity uh, known as hypothyroidism. And then again, when she uh, reassessed this in the 70s, it was as high as 30%. And of course, since the 90s, uh, and uh, those that came to Terry Hertog's lecture a couple of weekends ago. This is Jacques Hertog, his father, uh, documented in Europe that the prevalence was about of the order of 80% in the 1990s. So why the increase? Um, well, it's postulated that hypothyroid children now survive on over many generations and hence pass on the genes for hypothyroidism, perhaps. And there's an interplay with antibodies and the uh, uh, complexity of vaccines affecting genes. Uh, of course, we have this notion that the hypothyroid uh, client is attracted to the hypothyroid mate. Uh, so, you know, often similar entities are attracted to each other, same low activity lifestyle, of course they reproduce. And then we've got other confounding variables. Let us not forget environmental toxicity heavy metal toxicity, which is just becoming immense in this uh, current climate, and other toxins. Uh, one of the other things that I do is uh, through the FIFA philosophy, I treat a lot of autism, and of course we're seeing huge ri ri rises in the prevalence of autism in this country. Uh, Mary Megson from Chicago, who came out recently to work with us, uh, said when she started 10 years ago, uh, the autism prevalence, in her, uh, her opinion, was something of the order of uh, three or four children per 10,000. And now they're looking at uh, of something of the order of 100 uh, children per 10,000 in the States. And we're following similar trends. Uh, so back to the thyroid issue, uh, really a lot of our thyroid patients or thyroid clients are underdiagnosed. So what is the cause? What, is, what do we understand as the etiology? Um, thyroid failure of the primary gland itself, referred to as primary hypothyroidism, certainly is the most common reason why we see uh, hypothyroidism. Then we have uh, low TSH picture, and so of course that infers that the pituitary itself is failing to produce uh, the thyroid, uh, the stimulation to the thyroid gland. Uh, then we have tertiary hypothyroidism, which would imply that there's low thyrotropic releasing hormone uh, from hypothalamic damage. And of course, today we heard um, from uh, uh, Dr. Gordon uh, the prevalence of brain injury and the, you know, the underestimation of the prevalence of this problem in our society. 
I mean, uh, I had to think back to my birth and thought, okay, I'd have a forceps delivery. And mum said I was, you know, in labour for 48 hours. Well, she was in labour for 48 hours. So that might explain some of my uh, deficits. Uh, so um, it is interesting, you know, and, and think back, you know, to relevant uh, uh, head injuries where even just a laceration was required to be, you know, repaired by the local doctor. It probably has had some impact on the pituitary stalk and uh, resulting in failure of signalling of the hypothalamus to the pituitary. Uh, con conversion failure of T4 to T3 is actually probably the second most common cause of hypothyroidism if we really think about it. Uh, receptor uptake failure, uh, it's kind of a notion like type 2 diabetes. In a sense, it's a type 2 hypothyroidism. Uh, and then let us not forget adrenal insufficiency. It's another very common problem that we address on a daily basis. And, of course, we know that lowered cortisol affects the thyroid production and conversion and also receptor uptake. <clears throat> so how do you diagnose hypothyroidism? Uh, the obvious uh, lab tests are TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, free T4. It's important to specify free T4, not just T4. Uh, if this lab that you work with doesn't do that kind of testing, see if you can organize for the bloods to be sent to someone like ARL or PATH lab or an appropriate facility that does that kind of testing. Uh, <clears throat> free T3. Uh, Mark Gordon was asking me just then, uh, do I routinely ask for reverse T3? It's part of my routine assessment if I'm looking at the thyroid gland and certainly thyroid antibodies. And he's been seeing, you know, of the order of prevalence of perhaps 30% of clients presenting with a high reverse T3. And likewise, that's something I'm seeing now. Um, and of course, you can't just uh, investigate thyroid as a sole entity. Uh, a good anti-aging integrative practitioner is holistic and considers the whole symphony of orchestra of hormones. So you do need to look at other things like fasting insulin, uh, cortisol levels, uh, your, your androgenic hormones such as DHEA, testosterone and your estrogens. Um, besides doing blood, of course, urine analysis is actually the more overall accurate way of assessing uh, deficiency. So if you have doubt about blood tests, don't forget that you can do 24-hour uh, urines, and uh, this is something routinely done by PATH Lab and, and, and like facilities. Uh, so we can look at FT, free T4, free T3. And of course in the urine we can also look at the other side, we can look at the catabolic hormones, cortisol and the hydroxysteroid metabolites, and of course the flip side, the DHEA and the 17 keto steroids, steroids the anabolic ones, and also estrogen and its metabolites through urine. So how to diagnose hypothyroidism? Well, first of all, we may see the low T4 picture on the blood test, and uh, that should then cause you to consider looking at tyrosine and iodine deficiencies. Um, don't forget, uh, when treating someone with hypothyroidism, you can treat with iodine up to a certain point. But once you've reached that saturation point and you go beyond the requirement for iodine, you're actually going to induce hypothyroidism. So only treat up to the level of uh, flush where the, you know, the requirements are for, for 80, 90th percentile. But don't over-treat with iodine because it will actually have a negative effect. Uh, low T3, if that is the presentation on the pathology, then you need to check for selenium deficiencies because by rectifying these underlying nutrient deficiencies, you can correct the overall problem and negate the need for thyroid hormone itself. And, of course, the other way that we often see the presentation in SERA is elevated TSH uh, or, as, as we've already said, the patient presents with clinical symptoms uh, sometimes with a free T3 that's below the optimal range or the free T4 and the TSH often being normal themselves. <clears throat>